So now let's come into the next and probably very obvious increment in integrated y's. Integration. When you have a cup of tea and you add milk to it, you stir in the milk. You don't just pour it in because you want it to integrate with the tea. Now, if you didn't do that, then the milk being heavier would tend to go to the bottom and the tea would be at the top. Now, I'm not 100% sure that that's always true because the temperature of one and the temperature of the other, the colder a thing is, okay, the more it sinks to the bottom. And I would think that water gets colder faster than milk. But therefore the milk might be on the top but the point is they separate they have to keep on being stirred to be integrated and really what you have is a molecule of milk and a molecule of tea right side by side they don't actually merge into each other but it is a kind of integration the same thing is true for your own nature your soul is always your soul. It doesn't ever merge with your body. Your body is your body and your ha and that's your house. That's how David puts it in Psalm 139, if they translated it properly, which they never do. Okay, because, you know, the whole womb thing is a political football. So, David was saying in Psalm 139, my body is my house and you knew me before I existed. And you even went to the trouble to figure out how my parts of my house would be knitted together, as he puts it, in my mother's womb. He's talking about the house. The guy went to all this trouble for nine months before even creating David's soul. And yet knew David before creating his soul and actually wanting to create his soul and actually wanting to create David. So now that David is inside the house, outside the womb, you know, it's outside the womb, inside the house, is the way the, the sequence goes. He's saying, how precious are your thoughts? Basically saying, hi, I'm outside the womb now, inside my house now, so that I have thoughts, so I can see your thoughts. That's, it's, it's beautiful the way David organizes it. Okay, that's a sequence of integration. Something gets built, then another thing gets built, then another thing gets built, and then something else, somewhere else, is also getting built piecemeal, or all at once, and then they're joined together like milk and tea. You know, milk. How does milk get made? Well, first you got to have the cow. But the cow doesn't start out as a cow. It starts out as a calf. And it has to grow. And it eats and it eats and it shits and it eats and it shits and it eats and it shits. And, and then it's finally all, it's all grown up now. Yeah, and now it can make milk. And then somebody's got to squeeze the teats or they have milking machines now. And then that, that milk gets into some kind of a container. The container goes into some kind of pasteurization unit, which heats the milk just enough so that it kills the germs. Okay, and then it goes into a bottling plant to be put into bottles, either, you know, glass bottles or plastic, and then sent to the store, and then you're going to have to have, you're going to either go yourself, or someone's going to the store for you, gets the milk, brings it home, and puts it in your refrigerator, then you take it out of the refrigerator, and you take out a glass, and you pour out into the glass the milk, and then you drink the milk. That was all involved in making the milk. And of course, tea is the same thing, except that there are leaves that somebody has to plant, you know, the seeds and grow them and then dry out the leaves and then get those things packaged and those things sent, depending on what kind of tea it is. Usually it's foreign, but it could be made in the United States, I suppose. I don't know where tea production is in the United States. And then that has to go to the store. Then, that, then you have, or somebody else has to go to the store, buy it, bring it home, put it in the, you know, the shelf, and then make the tea. 
So combining tea and milk is really the product of a lot of other processes that took place first before the integration. Notice that the integration is the final step. After all that other stuff happened, you would have two separate things be created with a whole bunch of steps prior, each one of those being an integration of its own, in order for the final integration of the two separate things to occur together in the cup, the tea and the milk. So we got exactly the wrong idea of the spiritual life. We are totally disintegrated from God when we talk about Him in our pulpits. First of all, everything we say about the Bible and God and everything else is kind of restricted to the childish notions of morality. And they are childish. Okay? They're definitely not spiritual. Because if morality were spirituality, then any Muslim doing a good deed, any Baha'i or atheist or agnostic doing a good deed, well then that's worthy of salvation. Duh. And your typical person thinks that you have to be a good person to go to heaven, which is totally non-spiritual. And besides, what's a good person? A good person by your definition is not a good person by God's definition. A good person by Saudi Arabia's definition is not a good person by, I don't know, Germany's definition, China's definition. The Quranic idea of a good person is Muhammad. He was a rapist. He was a pillager. He thighed a three-year-old girl or six-year-old girl. Thighing means that you put your, your member between the legs of the child and you sort of move around on top of the child until you reach orgasm. You're not putting it in the child, you're putting it between the legs of the child and using the legs to you know what. I don't know if it gets sicker than that. That's a practice done by many Muslims today. They're sex-crazy people. Absolutely sex-crazy. And the Quran is full of sex-oriented stuff. That's not spiritual. But if they do a good deed, oh boy, if morality is it. Honey, they belong in heaven then, according to the way the pulpits are teaching, the Christian pulpits and the Jewish pulpits. It's really sick how we are so disintegrated from God. And notice, disintegrated, not integrated. Not integrated means disintegrated. And that's why Christianity and Judaism are disintegrating. People by the hundreds, at least, if not thousands, are abandoning both Christianity and Judaism. For good reason. All, all they offer is be a good person, be a good person, be moral. Well, whoop de doo you don't need religion for that. It's just common sense. You get along with your fellow man if you're nice. So how is that being spiritual? It's pathetic how we spit on Christ. It really is. All right, so disintegration is mainstream Christianity, mainstream Judaism, because they're constantly harping on doing good deeds and being moral. That's not integration with God. That's integration with Satan. Because that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to present to God a, a world that needs no God. A world that's so good on its own that God has to say, Oh, wow, Satan, you achieved this. Then I've got to say that you're right. And then Satan wins in the angelic conflict. How can the Jews and the Christians be so damn dumb? They don't notice that in the Bible. That wasn't the first thing that Satan tried to do to beat God. The first thing Satan tried to do was wipe out the human race. That's why you had the Noah issue. He tried to wipe out the human race by making them all sex crazy. And by, you know, the angels sort of procreating 
with the humans taking on human form because their bodies are made out of light. They can turn the light, their bodies into anything. Okay, well, turn your bodies into human bodies. Procreate. Make everybody sex crazy because obviously they'd be really good at sex. And then, you know, propagate half angel, half human. And then there won't be any pure humans left in order for a messiah to possibly be born as pure human. That was the goal. Genesis 6 says so right there. Very bald text and the theologians are all nervous about it. Because like Psalm 139, they want to make it a political football. Why? Right. Angels' bodies are made out of light. Can they turn their light into matter? Ah, duh. We all know that energy and matter are two sides of a spectrum. The difference is they can will it. If your body is made out of light and you have control over your body, well, God, you can make your body be whatever you want. Okay? It, it, it's just as hard for them to make their body into a human as it is for you to make salad. That's the power they have we don't. So, you know, we're all... <gasps> and that's exactly what happened. Is that the humans seeing the, you know, the angels turn themselves into humans? Of course they would be gorgeous. Oh, you're so beautiful if they made themselves into female. Oh, you're so handsome if they made themselves into male, depending on who they wanted to seduce. I, I, what's so hard to understand about this? We are not the top of the food chain. Duh. We all know that. Even atheists know that. Atheists just differ as to who is the top of the food chain. We call it God, and angels, and then us. And they call it, I don't know, aliens from outer space. Well, angels are aliens from outer space. There's plenty of evidence. Duh! So here's the point. You can integrate with God, or you can integrate with Satan, or you can integrate with the world. And one idea of integration very early on was sex. In order to, you know, wreck the gene pool. So there would be no such thing as a pure human. Except that Noah, his wife, and his sons, and the wives that they eventually got, wouldn't do that. They were all pure human. There were eight humans left. Now here's the kicker. Sometime at, sometime during while they were in the boat, the wives got pregnant. Because in the same year that they, that the flood finished, okay, kids were born to Shem. Shem, Ham, and David, yeah, Shem. In the same year, the inundation, two years after the inundation began, his kids were born when he was a hundred. Okay, which means that two years after the inundation began, it began, lasted a year, that's one year, and then in the following year, those kids were born. So they could have been born, and according to the math of the Bible itself, they were born at the beginning of the second year after the inundation began, which means they were born about one year after the inundation began, which means that Shem's wife was pregnant while they were on the boat. Well, Peter says only eight humans were on the boat. So fetus isn't being counted. Of course, fetus isn't considered a person under Exodus 21-22. Now, what's that point about? Integration with God doesn't begin until birth. Can't begin until birth because you're not a person until then. Because that's when your soul is made and integrated with your body. So now, here you are, a soul inside a body that God creates, integrated in your body. You didn't make yourself be integrated in your body 
and you weren't you until the the body exited and God imputed his soul to the exiting fetus. But he did the integration. You think, move my fingers, and your fingers move. How come? You didn't create that ability. It was given to you, just like angels have the ability with bodies of light to just think themselves into being human, and they are. That was an ability given them by God. It's an integrated ability. You want it? There it is. You want to move your fingers? Unless there's something, you know, medically wrong with your fingers, you can move them just by willing it. That's integration. That's what integration is. The quest, the question and the issue is to have that kind of integration with God. So that you're always in a bi-directional feedback vertically. In, the, in ballet, they call it pas de deux. Okay? And it, it literally means the stepping of two steps. Okay, but but it, but that that's a the literal meaning is not the figurative meaning. The, the the idiomatic meaning is the idea of two people moving so flawlessly together that it's as if they were one person. That's why Baryshnikov was so you know famous because the way he and um, I forget the name of the girl that he danced with the most. The way he and the girl that he was dancing with, okay, moved, okay. The way they moved together. It was two people, but they were so coordinated together, so integrated in their movements, that it was like one fluid motion of the two of them dancing together. Supposedly, Rudolf Nureyev was like that, too. Okay? That's what pas de deux is. Two dancers moving in one fluid line together, so it's as if it is one entity, even though it's really two people. That's the way it's supposed to work with God. And you hear it, I mean, the example of how it actually plays, you hear it happening while I'm talking to you sometimes. He, he hits me, literally, hits me with a verse or an idea. And it, obviously the part to do at my end is not working real well because I'm like, what? You know, it, it, it stops the flow of my thinking. And I have to ask him, well, what'd you say? Because I wasn't expecting that. I was thinking toward the recorder. I'm not thinking toward him when I talk. He's the one interrupting. Now, a positive would be where he could say what he's saying while I'm talking, and I'm actually listening to him and talking to you at the same time. I haven't mastered that skill yet. That's one of the reasons I keep making these audios. How do I listen to what he wants said? And sort of check it with him before my mouth moves. And then my mouth moves out to talk to you. I'm not doing that yet. And you can tell because he interrupts me. But I know it's him. And then I try because obviously I'm supposed to tell you. I repeat what I think he said. And I, I usually get most of it right. Not all of it. So it's a skill. Like playing basketball or piano when I'm talking in these audios, I'm learning a skill. If you get something out of it, God causes that. I don't. Me, I'm practicing. That's all I'm doing. But it, notice how it's integration. You listen for what He wants. Ideally, what I should be doing is, okay, Dad, what should I say next? And then I'm still at the stage where I wait and wait and wait and wait. And then I don't know what to say next. If I do it that way. But he says in scripture, don't worry about what you're going to say. God will just give you the words. And I've noticed after the fact, after I've made these audios, that I go back and I listen to them. Because I have no idea what I'm going to say next. I'm laying on my back, talking into a tape recorder. And I look back, oh, that was what you wanted. So he knows what I'm going to say next. And somehow I'm caused to know that and just say it without realizing that it's I'm online with him. I mean, I'm between sins, hopefully. That's integration. Now, why is that so important? Because in heaven, that's the way it's going to play if you're king. That's the way all your subjects need it to play if you're king. And why is that true? Because integration is a matter of horizontal planes 
of interaction. Let me repeat that. Integration is a matter of horizontal planes of interaction. Horizontal, not vertical. Your body is horizontal. Your soul is supposed to be vertical with God. You play with your soul vertically to God and then back from Him to you, bidirectional, and then horizontally out to your body and out to the world. So the intersection is horizontal, not vertical. The vertical is supposed to be a oneness. Christ prayed for John 17. So you're already in Christ. That's already true. That's a oneness. The, the, the milk and the tea are already side by side. In the cup, you're in Christ. He drank the cup. The cup was a cup of sin. The sins were yours. So you're in Christ. First, Second Corinthians 5.21. All done. Okay, but what's not done? How do you use your position in Christ? That's what you have. It's real. But how does it function? It's like somebody knocking at the door. Okay? Somebody knocking at the door like that. Hi, I'm from Blaylock and Blaylock, and you just inherited half of Scotland. And you're standing at the door, and the guy from Blaylock and Blaylock is standing at the door. And yes, you're the new laird of Scotland, some portion of it. What do you do with that? It's true. It's real. It's yours. But do you know what to do with it? No. That's what all of us are in. That's the position. That's our real... That's the real story of this life. It is not what you see in politics. It is not what you see out in the world. The world is a training ground for the Christian. For the person who's not yet a Christian, it's a, how do you want to call it, a stage to get you aware of heaven. Once you're aware of heaven, because you're saved, then you just use what's here to train for heaven. This is all, Paul just calls it a pregnancy. Romans 8. This whole world is just a pregnancy. It means nothing. There's nothing going on in history ever, laterally, horizontally, that of itself means anything. Period. Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. So your whole life down here is to get ready for heaven. That's what you're supposed to use everything in your life for. That's why the integration is to have the vertical integration from God, the bidirectional, which only works via Bible doctrine getting in your soul, and you're using it. And then you take that information and you apply it to your body, to your soul, to your life, to the externals of the world. That's all the world is good for. It's not good for anything else. Period. Now, the world doesn't know that. The world doesn't like that. The world doesn't want God. Satan's very well aware of that. Satan's doing what he can to deflect the attention of the world away from the God question and onto itself. So being moral, disintegrated from God, is pitched as being spiritual. And then, of course, the atheists and the agnostic and all the others look at that and say, well, heck, I'm moral. So how is that, what does that have to do with God? Doesn't have anything to do with God. But when the Christian says it does, or the Muslim says it does, or the other religion says it does, then what's the need for God? You mean moral without God? In fact, that's the default. Because moral means you want to get along with other people. Because it's kind of boring to be all by yourself. So you learn how to be nice to other people. So that you can be around other people. Morality is a way of getting along. Isn't that spiritual? 
but the Christian over wants it and tries to claim it as spiritual. And it's hysterical how silly we get. One group of Christians says it's spiritual not to drink coffee or tea or alcohol. Really? One group of Christians says you have to wear a certain kind of underwear. That's holy. Okay. Another group of Christians says, well, you have to count beads with a cross attached. And that's holy. Muslims say that too without the cross attached. Okay. Another group, and they're not Christians, say you have to chant Nam Yo Ho Meng Renge Kyo. Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo. Oh, really? Chanting is spiritual. Okay. Another group, and they're not Christians either, say that you have to bob in front of the wailing wall and wear a little payas down your sideburns. And little tzitzit, tassels, on shawls that you wrap around your waist. And now you're holy because you're doing that, wearing a big funky hat. Yeah, that's spiritual because you're chanting it. Okay. See, they all sound the same, don't they? They have different specifics and they're all petty. And that's spiritual. And of course you have to be good and give money to the church and make sure that you're seen doing it and blah 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 blah. And then everybody just brags about how good they are. And God is supposed to be impressed. That's not integrated with God. What's that integrated with? this world so then you're supposed to if you're going to impress God with how good you are same temptation that Satan made to the woman in the garden then that's not integrating with God by contrast the integrated why of integrating with God is on a much higher plane of existence because God, what do you think of? And it doesn't matter what the object is. It matters what God thinks about it. Because he has an attitude. Whatever his attitude is, that's a much higher plane of existence. God, what do you think of what I should have for breakfast? And you say, well, Brandon, isn't that petty? Well, not necessarily. Because whatever God thinks, it's enjoyable. Whatever God thinks, it's going to be witty. Whatever God thinks, it's going to be high-minded. And whatever God thinks, it's going to make whatever it is you eat much more enjoyable to eat. And it really isn't about the food, is it? It's about the principles behind the food. I mean, why do you have to even eat in the first place? Didn't God design you to have a body that your house, that you walk around in like David said, and oh, you have to eat. Why did he design it that way? What philosophical idea is in his mind to decide, oh, I'm going to create this being that eats and shits? Seriously. What does that tell you about God? Now here's the kicker about it. God very clearly doesn't care about all the highfalutin stuff we call respect. God obviously doesn't care about all the highfalutin stuff we call status. Status doesn't mean a thing to him. And he's God. If ever status ought to mean something to somebody, shouldn't it mean something to God? He's holy. He's top of the heap. He's number one. Who should get more respect than him? And he doesn't even care if he gets it. Because look, if he cared, then he wouldn't invent P. If he cared about status then he wouldn't invent 
defecation. If he cared about status, he wouldn't invent sex. Did you ever think about that? Sex is pretty messy. But most of the people I know who like it, they really like it. Doesn't matter to them that it's messy. The messiness is part of the enjoyment of it to them. God invented it. He doesn't have sex. But he invented it. So he's constantly seeing it. From time immemorial, before it physically existed, and to all of eternity future when it's long since ceased to exist, he will still be seeing, experiencing, everybody having sex, everybody peeing, everybody shitting. Why? Why did he impose that on himself? And you say, well, he's omniscient. Yeah, and omniscient and omnipotent together means he can choose what knowledge is. He can choose what existence is. In other words, God is not constrained to be stuck with P. He wanted its existence. And therefore it exists. Why? Because to say I want the existence of P. Because he is omniscient. He is eternal. Means he will always experience it. When I go to the bathroom two, two minutes afterwards I forget about it. But it's always playing before him. What does that tell you about him? What does that tell you about integration? Now, I've talked about this before, truth be free, and all these other angles of it, but now I'm focusing on one particular really important thing to say about him and his personality in integrated wise. The plane of existence, of thinking, the highest plane of existence you can live on is God's. And you can live on it because he enables you to think like he does. So how is it that he thinks? He doesn't care about status. Obviously, because P exists and shit exists and sex exists and all these other, you know, kind of gross things exist. And a lot of people will disagree with me and say, well, sex isn't gross. Okay, fine. But gross things exist and he forever experiences them because he's omniscient. And he could choose not to experience them. But he doesn't choose that. So then he doesn't care about status. Because all of us sure do. I mean, look, we, when we have bathrooms, I know in some cultures it's not like this, but most cultures, when you got to go to the bathroom, you create a little private space for yourself. Because to you, it's, it's, it's somewhat embarrassing, degrading. Okay? To be seen in the act of. Nobody particular. I mean, we enjoy being relieved. But, you know, we, we, most of us, if, if asked, if you had to give up something, a bodily function, most of us wouldn't be, too, it wouldn't be too hard for us to say, gee, I wish I didn't have to pee. Gee, I wish I didn't have to defecate and clean myself. Who of us wouldn't say that? It's an inconvenience at the very least. All right? And I, granted, you know, even that stuff was used in the ancient world. They used to collect it because it can be used as fertilizer and, and actually, um, what do you want to call it? Um, fuel. God was smart when he did that too. But why would he subject himself to that? And here's the answer. He doesn't care about the status. He doesn't care about subjecting himself to it. So why? 
obviously there's only one answer that you can you can lay out there there's only one answer that makes sense he finds value in it so he decreed its existence he created value in it for himself to see forever because he's going to see it forever so there must be value in it real value that he creates and he loves seeing it when it happens that's kind of hard to you know accept so status doesn't mean anything to him now if that's God's plane of existence and that's the highest plane of existence you can live on why God wants why God doesn't want what God thinks about it why this why that God 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 and that's how your brain is turning all the time and informing your decisions then you're at the highest plane of existence as a human integrated with him I'm not saying it's perfectly functioning. It's habitual. And that was what how you know it's integrated. The integration is a process that never ends. It always gets better and better or worse and worse. But as a habit, if it's occurring as a habit, that means the integration that that, that enough has built, you know, this the the tea leaves between the tea leaves becoming the tea and the milk being produced as milk, they're mixing together. The stirring of the milk is occurring. If you're constantly thinking of God, 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 God. That's the highest plane of horizontal existence you can be on. Horizontal. Because when you're thinking God, 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 what you're doing is you're thinking vertically toward God and from God and about God, but your purpose in doing so is to decide what you're going to do with your body. That's horizontal. What you're going to do in your life. That's horizontal. And you're making that decision because you don't want to do with your body. You don't want to live your life unless it's based on God, 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 God. It's a preference. You're preferring to operate on God, 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 God as your desired reason for living. So therefore that's a horizontal plane of existence. Now notice, you're eons higher in that horizontal plane of existence. Driven by that motive with all that Bible doctrine you got so that you can start determining answers and applying them to your life. So it took you years to get there. That's eons higher a plane of existence than your average human being. Your average human being gets up in the morning and mindlessly makes the bed, mindlessly gets breakfast, mindlessly, you know, takes a shower, Maybe thinks about, you know, turns on the television, listens to the news. It's going through, you know, rote tasks. Barely thinking. And if thinking is thinking about stuff like, what do I eat? What do I have to do at work today? Do I have to take out the trash? Johnny needs a haircut. Oh, I better get the car done. Oh, I don't like that Julia person. She she's she wears a nasty red dress. I mean, the thoughts are petty. They're small. They're stupid. They're just like James Joyce wrote about in his book Ulysses. Okay, petty, small, nothing, stupid. That's how man's mind works. The people who support Donald Trump, their minds are like. Ten-year-olds. I don't know if you... It's like the people in the, the popular movies. What's popular in movies? Sexual stuff. Violence. Crime. Money. 
That's what some people's minds. Bathroom humor. I mean, how petty do you have to be to be making an issue about Bill Clinton's, what do you call it, his affairs 20 years ago? Or Bill Cosby's affairs 20 years ago? How petty do you have to be? And oh, that's that's supposed to be news. And a pres a presidential candidate is going to make an ad about that. How presidential is that? What kind of plane of existence is that? Very low, peasant, gutter. The peasants are always concerned and always get their ha has on sexual jokes, sexual issues, bathroom issues, pee, shit, ah, you know, bathroom jokes. It's all over low comedy in, in, on the television. Somebody farts. Ha, 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 ha. Somebody farts. That's not a high plane of existence of thinking. That's almost animalism. All those Saudi videos, the videos of the Saudis that you can get on YouTube, they're almost always sexual in nature. Or seeing them do stupid things. The whole Arab religion thing is, is petty like that. The whole Quran is petty like that. That's a plane of existence. And it's really low. That's how Christians live, too. They're all up in arms about abortion. That's a sexual thing. It really, the truth of it is, is all those self-righteous people are worried that some gal got away with having sex. And now she's going to have an abortion so she can't be penalized by having children. They want her to be penalized by having kids. They don't care about the kids. They care about her getting punished for having Sex out of wedlock, according to them. See, to them, if you seek an abortion, it must have been illegal sex that you had. There couldn't possibly be another reason. And they want you to be punished. And they're mad that God doesn't strike you with lightning. So they're going to Caesar instead. Pro lifers are some of the most petty people ever. They're truly disgusting. They're bottom feeders. They're living on the lowest plane of existence. That's a plane of existence. Their thoughts are all about people and bodily function. Now, morality, distrust morality, it's the same thing. And what do they define as morality? Whether you have sex or not with somebody they consider right or wrong. That's not spirituality. And what the hell concern is it of theirs? Okay? But they are living on a horizontal plane of existence that's just like all those cheap, cheap, cheap people in any other part of the world that aren't Christian. Because that's how everybody lives. They're always looking at their neighbor into their neighbor's window. And they're always trying to pass judgment on their neighbor. And it's all bodily function. And do you have more than I have? And what are you doing with your body? And what does your body look like? And where are you peeing? And, and, and who are you having sex with? Really low. Imagine being God and you have to hear that thinking all day long. And for them... The world is all about status. I'm bigger than you. I'm better than you. I'm richer than you. My God is better than your God. I'm more moral than you. See how good I am. Pat me on the back. What kind of plane of existence is that? That's the world. Gutter. 
and here you are, one in a million. Okay, Dad, if I'm going to open the refrigerator and have breakfast, what kind of breakfast would like most to pick a doctor and you want me to remember? Should it be Kashi for breakfast? Should it be oatmeal? Should it be a cup of peanut butter? What doctrine will resemble some food? Because after you do it that way, whenever you see that food again, you'll be reminded of the doctrine. And God's hearing you ask those questions. Not dip, dip, dip. How oh, was so and so? Was having sex with so and so? See the big difference? You see why it's beautiful to God to hear His word cycling inside us all? And you know how rare that is. So you don't have to feel guilty that, whoa, you got this really much better life. Because it really is better life. It's happier. You get to think about God and His Word instead of beep, yip, yip about what your neighbor is or isn't doing between her legs. I'm seriously, what is a happier life? The rest of the world is busy bottom feeding like cat, catfish or lobster. Both of those fish are like not allowed under the Mosaic Law because they're bottom feeders. That's what the world is. Bunch of bottom feeders. And that's the awareness that they have. This is how they're going to die. Even if saved. They have spent their life bottom feeding. That's their horizontal plane of existence at the bottom of the ocean. Where you... You're swimming at the surface. You're in the sunshine. They're down in the darkness where all the detritus is located. And they consider themselves holy for wallowing in it. Now here's the most important part about all that. When we die, the only thing we take with us is the doctrine we've learned. That's what Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians 3. Gold, silver, precious stones, that's doctrine. That's what Paul, you know, Christ was talking about, where the treasure is, so will your heart be. Okay? And he talks about true riches. And so Paul is playing with that concept that Christ talked about in the Gospels, saying, you know, gold, silver, precious stones. Because when Paul wrote uh, Corinthians and Romans, well, Corinthians. Yeah, Corinthians and Romans. Corinthians, Romans. Okay, yeah, when Paul when Paul wrote Romans, not Corinthians. Corinthians was written before. When Paul wrote Romans, Luke's gospel had just come out. Or, or was just coming out at the same time. Because the book of Romans comes out because Paul goes to jail. Okay, the book of Romans and Luke and James all come out in the same year, which is 58 AD, 58, 59 AD, according to their meter. Okay, uh, I forget what months, but it's in Luke Dateline Meters dot H dot PDF. Anyway, the point is, is that when, when Paul's writing Romans, Matthew's gospel was already out. Luke's gospel was coming out coterminous. So when he's talking about gold, silver, precious stones back in Corinthians, it was known what was going to end up being what was in Luke, uh, Matthew's gospel at the time, when Christ said true riches, because that's in Matthew. And it was known, or was going to be known, I guess, because he was traveling with Luke, um, that Luke was going to play on that. So he's saying gold, silver, precious stones is true riches. Okay? Now, that being the case, the true riches to you when you're living your life on the higher integrated plane is that you get to turn breakfast into an opportunity to play with Bible doctrine with God. So it's not merely what you do with your body. I've said that before. That's a habit that you get into. It's that kind of thinking throughout your life while you're in this body down here. That forms a pattern, a structure, 
of dendrites and axons, so to speak, in your spiritual soul, your spiritual um, brain, which is in your soul, really. That's a, that's, those are like little highways and byways of thinking, traveling, how your thought travels. Remember I talked about thought traveling? That's, that's a horizontal plane of existence, is how your thought travels. That becomes a habit down here for you. On a higher horizontal plane. Okay, but everybody else, they're busy groveling at the bottom. And so their daily thought pattern, when they get up, has absolutely nothing to do with God. In fact, it has absolutely nothing to do with anything. They have no frame of reference. Okay? They're just thinking with their body. Their whole body is running their soul. Not their soul running their body. In your case... Your soul is not only running your body, the Bible is running your soul, and the Holy Spirit is running the Bible in your soul. And that is the integration going on in your life. But in their life? I have no idea what that even is. So they die and remain. This is the killer for me. They die and remain. That restricted closest book that actually helps you understand this and it's a satire is a book by a guy named Aldous Huxley from last century called Brave New World now the only part of that book that really ties in here is the idea that there are actually classes of people by thinking pattern he called it intelligence the idea being that, you know, in order to do a, a stupid job, only a, a stupid person is going to like doing a stupid job, which is true. Huh? So in the Huxley book, the idea was that somebody came up with the idea of making people so that they their personalities and their likes and their dislikes were suited to the kind of job that they were going to have in order to be productive members of society. And then all that was genetically controlled. And then, of course, the, to make the plot of the book, one of the people who was made to be a certain way, the, the, he something happens to him wrong in the test tube, and then a whole bunch of scandal results. It's really kind of cute. But the point is simply that in heaven, people are determining their own soul structure so as a result there are classes in society in the eternal state and in the book of, of Huxley's it was Alpha Beta Delta Gamma okay Alpha being the smartest which would be the, the spiritual kings in God's kingdom okay Beta being next below and Delta being next below and Gamma being next below and then of course the really bottom feeder was an epsilon, which is basically going, oh, oh, oh roof. Yeah. Well, actually, below that, a delta would be, or gamma would be maybe saying, oh, roof. Oh, it's an apple. Apple. That's an apple. Apple. Horsey. That 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 uh, uh what's it, what's it called? A tor 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 tor. What is it? I can't say that. That's how childish the people are down here. That's what they're choosing to be. That's what they like, and that's how they'll be in heaven too. Jesus loves me, this I know, cause the Bible tells me so. Now, I'll bet you don't want to be like that forever. They're choosing to be like that forever. And my big question mark, and my pastor had this question too, is do you really have to stay that limited forever? Or isn't there some mechanism of spiritual growth? My pastor thought not. 
I'm going to disagree with them mainly because I want to disagree with them and say, no, you can still grow, but the amount of growth is going to be real slow. I mean, because even an epsilon can learn something. But it takes forever, and it's very little, and then a little more, and then a little more, and that's why heaven lasts forever. So yeah, everybody's continually learning something, but it's extremely limited, and that's why there has to be a king, because they can't relate to God. Yes, everybody will know him. But no is a relative term. I mean, I know something about my car. But my car mechanic really knows my car. I don't. So he knows my car, and I know my car. But the degree to which he knows my car is much better than the degree to which I know my car. Okay, I know God far better than most people. I didn't cause that to happen. All I did was say yes. Anybody else who says yes, they would know the same thing. But they don't choose to say yes. It doesn't make me better than them. But I do know him better than them. I didn't cause that to happen. He said, anybody you want to know, anything you want, ask me. I ask. They don't. Does that make me better? No. But it does make me know. Is it my power? No. Is it my goodness? No. It's his. But they didn't want his. So eventually, I die. Eventually, they die. We are each the accumulation of what we wanted of him. Because he said so. Now look at what results. What results is a sad state of affairs where a lot of the people who are celebrities down here, really important people down here, will be the bottom feeders of heaven. Because they cared about life here horizontally, not vertically about God. So they didn't integrate with him. They integrated with the world. And eventually, as a result of doing that, you become a bottom feeder. You become totally oriented to your body. And your own impression of yourself. You become totally self-centered, totally world-centered. Even when you're altruistic. And the bottom of the bottom... It's where, oh, Jesus loves me, this I know. And, oh, pee, oh, poopo. Which is, you know, the attention that most people pay to life is all focused around their body, like a baby is preoccupied with his diapers. So who's going to lead the people out? See, there's a fourth salvation that everybody's missing. You get saved to go to heaven, but what, what about the salvation inside your head? Because the soul doesn't get replaced. The soul you got now is the same soul you'll always have. Because the soul is a real you. Okay, how does your thinking get saved? Well, the second salvation down here, James, book of James, is to get the implanted word in your soul. That's what the whole book of James is about. Abraham did that. That's why he was called the friend of God. That's what James is talking about in chapter 2. Maturation. Okay, but what if you didn't get that down here? You got saved. Because the word is implanted in your soul. The whole book of James is only addressed to believers. Jewish believers in particular there. Okay, you're saved. Okay, did your thinking get saved too? So, you're juridically saved. Going to heaven. Can't get out of that. Is your thinking saved? So that once you're in heaven, you can actually enjoy it at an adult, mature level? Yes, no. 
And for 99.9% of believers, the answer will be no. So that 0.1%, the kings have to help what? Save the rest forever. Little messiahs. That's why we're king of... He's king of kings. That's why we're kings. We're little messiahs of the messiah. Saving the rest of the people from that very childish bottom feeder thinking living on a much lower horizontal level. And then we'll keep living on that horizontal level. Forever. How do you save them? So we will be saviors. To the extent we're the kings. And if we're not the kings, if we're somewhere between the top and the bottom, we will be saving those below us and being saved by those above us in ever higher, ever higher planes of thinking. But you could have gotten to the God plane of thinking while you were down here. Because Christ went there. Because Christ is God. That's the copy book, as Peter puts it. That he left behind. Hupogramenoi is the key word in Greek. And that's how you'll find the verse. I forget where it is. It means copybook. It means a wax tablet that Roman kids used in order to learn how to draw their letters. The Roman letters. Because it was wax, so you carved it in wax. And then when you were done, you melted the wax and it was all smooth again very clever okay copying Christ is the whole point cloning Christ is what the Bible's for that's why it gets into your head the more it gets into your head the more like Christ you become the more but you become the way the truth the life like him and the more you become a king if you die before you actually get there to that level the maturation of Christ, Ephesians 4, 12 and 13, which is the criterion for the rapture, then you'll be somewhere between top and bottom. And the bottom feeders are going to be the many. The poor you will always have with you. That's what he said to me, which generated this audio. They will always be living on that low Benny Hill plane. That they're always going to be living like that. Because that's what they chose. And some of them are a little more intellectual than the others. So they'll be just a little bit higher. But they're all focused on the world, the world, the world, the world, the world. They're not looking at God. They're not living toward God first and toward the world as a consequence. They're living at the world and then they throw God's name on it to justify them living on the world. That's how Christianity is. So they'll all be bottom feeders. They'll all be like lobsters and crabs and catfish. Very delicious to eat. Scavengers. Always looking down. They don't know how to look up. The most they'll be able to do is some childish idea of God. And then when he comes around to your particular kingdom once maybe every thousand years, you might get to go see him more often, but he can't make the circuit. But every so often because, you know, he's in a body. They will see him. He will see the tips of his fingers waving as a di at a distance as he goes by in a parade. And they'll be talking about that for the next thousand years. Oh, Ruth. Oh, we saw the three, I saw three fingers of Jesus Christ when he was at the parade 800 years ago. And I'm trying to remember, was it the, yeah, it was, it was his, his pinky finger and his ring finger and oh, his middle finger. I saw, I, I, did I see the knuckles? Did I see this the first knuckle? I think I saw, I think I saw up to the second knuckle, which is most of those fingers. I saw that many. And everybody around the person telling the story will go, oh, ooh. No matter how many times that story is told over the next 800 
years. That's how low people are. They're still talking about some dress that Princess Diana wore 30 years ago. It's in a freaking museum. That's Those are human. That's human preoccupation. You think it's going to change in heaven? No. The only thing that changes in heaven is people won't want to sin anymore. But their sophistication level, their interests are low and to the ground now. And guess what? That's their soul. That's their preference. That's their thought pathway. That's how their thoughts travel. That's how their thoughts will still travel. That's why the kings are needed. Now the integration of why of being on the highest plane with God has to be explained from the standpoint of, okay, obviously the body needs it. I've said that before. But now look, if you're on that upper plane, you can't be living it based on status. And yet you have the status. You're going to be a king. Okay, whoop de doo No, seriously, think about this. You're king. You're better than everybody around you. What good does that do you? Wouldn't it be much nicer if everybody else who's lower than you were up higher so that you could have a better conversation with them so it wouldn't be so hard on you? See the point? So how do you want to be a king? Why does God want to be God? There must be something other than the status. See, Satan thinks it's all about status. He's all, if I be God, I'll be number one, rah, rah, rah me. That's all he thinks about. And God's answering all the time saying, Hello? What's the good of status if you're already number one? What good does it do you to be number one? I'm God already. Why would I make a creation like this if being number one was so important? Must be some other reason, huh? Okay. Being on that high plane with God to see why God wants what God wants and thinks what he thinks, even to the point of what do you choose for breakfast, helps you see God's own motive, which I've talked about before. And as you look at it, you realize, you know what? He doesn't care about the status. There's some kind of intrinsic beauty. Beauty. In the choices that he makes that ensures truth be free. Some kind of beauty in him creating pee. Some kind of beauty in him creating defecation. Now, the writers, or the, well, the, the sages, the so-called sages, the guys that are quoted in the Talmud, they knew that. They spend an inordinate amount of time in the Talmud talking about really menial, petty things. But the reason they're doing it is they're beneath it, beneath their talk, which is pretty hard to read because it's so annoying. But beneath their talk is this idea that God has a sense of humor in imputing even the smallest thing as an olive's bulk with meaning. And that that meaning is somehow divinely beautiful. And that's what really, you can talk to any rabbi you want. That's what the Talmud is about. is finding out the divine beauty in the mundane things. Okay? That's why the Jews are so, what do you want to call it, picky about mundane things. They, they forgot the original purpose. The original purpose is to see divine beauty in the law. That's why God created it that way. He wanted the law to have its own intrinsic value. Is it superior to something else? No. 
is a whole lot superior to it, but it still has its own value. That's a statement of divine intent. That's a statement of the divine personality that tells you how God thinks. So when he looks at P, he sees some intrinsic beauty in it and is happy that he made it. I don't share his viewpoint, but I know he has it. You might share his viewpoint, in which case you'll be ahead of me. But this is what he's doing. And when you live on that high, high lateral plane with him, looking at through his eyes at everything else in this life, you're really training for the next. To help them see beyond what they naturally will be seeing. And they will learn very little from you. But they'll learn something. And then you will know Again, from the divine perspective in the eternal state, you will be understanding why God wanted this even better than you will now. So that's the ultimate integrated why, is to be living on the highest lateral plane in this body, God's motive, God's eyes, seen through God's eyes, determining everything in your life based on what God thinks to better enjoy your own life. Not as a question of morality. As a question of just living a higher standard. Because you enjoy it more. And God is going to use that to train you in the eternal state. For it. Now the big thing to remember when you're going through all this. Is he will take you on round robin. He will take you to the bottom. And he will take you to the top. So that you get that full experience of what it's like for God to be God. And of the two, going to the bottom or going to the top, going to the top is harder. It's much harder to cope with that. My pastor freaked us out for years talking about this. He called it adversity testing. That's what I'm calling going to the bottom. Versus prosperity testing. That was his term for it. Which I'm calling going to the top. He took Moses to the bottom, and he took Moses to the top. He took David to the bottom, he took David to the top. All the Bible heroes, you can look at them. They have their bottom times, and they have their top times. Same for Paul. His bottom time was X, what was it, 22. His top time, of course, is writing scripture. And he tells you that. His own biographies, 1 and 2 Timothy, um, Galatians... I'm not sure if it's Galatians 3 or 5 or 1. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he tells you that. First part of 1 Corinthians 15. I want to say first 10 verses. God took him to the bottom. God took him to the top. So that you get the panoply. That's an old Roman phrase. Panoply means all the pieces of armor that a Roman soldier had to wear when he was out in the field. And then a panoply is like, you know, your shoulders, the, the shoulder plates and the breastplate and the greaves that you wore on your knees and the shoes and, you know, the, the various parts to protect you in battle. And then you had to assemble them and clean them every night and you had to assemble them just before you went to bed and stick them on a stake right next to where you slept on the ground so that you could quickly dress in the morning if there was a battle call. That was called a panoply. You can go look it up in Google. And Ephesians 5 is where, Ephesians 6, I think, actually, is where Paul uses the term. The full panoply, the helmet of salvation, I think he calls it, or the breastplate. The breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, helmet to protect your head, you're saved. Because your soul is in your head. Okay, you got that. Breastplate of righteousness, God can't, you know, the enemy can't attack you in your vitals because you know that you have God's righteousness. In other words, your defense against all the arguments that you're a putz. Because, yeah, you're a putz, but it doesn't matter. All right, that kind of stuff. The full panoply of God taking you high and low is the same sort of thing. He's letting you find out all of his motives by taking you there. Now, sometimes it'll have to do with remedial, you know, you screwed up somewhere, and he's correcting you. 
But that's usually nothing compared to the main purpose. The main purpose is to get you to see the full spectrum of the doctrine and the plan of God, and especially Him personally, how He thinks about everything. That equips you for eternity, because then you know how He thinks, and you can share with your kingdom that you're going to actually literally create. Because they won't know. And the amount that they'll learn from you each day, no matter how much you give them, will be very limited and small. It's trickle-down spiritual economics. And it's the only way it works for freedom's sake. See, you don't sacrifice freedom that way. And that's the way it will always be. And then you know what it's like, as it were, to be God in the eternal state. You will know what it's like to be God because you will have, as it were, God-like powers. To help them. To see Him. But you'll be doing it the same way He does. So that high plane of existence, you need to get to now. And you won't understand it for years. But just practice now. Hi, Dad, what should I be thinking? Every time, ask him to remind you to ask the question. You go to eat, you go to sleep, you go to clean yourself, you go to write an email. What should I be thinking, Dad? Just keep asking the question and ask him to remind you to ask the question. Because that's getting the vertical up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And hopefully I don't have to remind you what up, down, up, down, up, down reminds you of. Okay? He's your husband. You're the bride. Okay? Get it? Sunamon lo get And... Sumbibadzo. Ephesians 4, 16. What a man does to a woman on the wedding night. Both of those verbs, which are hidden in translation. Usually called knitted together and joined. Can you guess what kind of knitting and what kind of joining? Hmm? Except it's vertical thought intercourse from God to you. You get that going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Asking the question, which I think, Dad, which I think, Dad, which I think, Dad, and remind me when I'm not asking that question. And you won't necessarily know the answers. But you're asking the question, and that's building a highway of the question. And then you'll find out. It'll start happening to you. You'll start throwing information down that p- pathway. Okay? While you're in the middle of doing something else. And then you'll be on that horizontal plane with them. More and more often. Until it forms a highway. And that'll take years. But every single day can be an addition. Why wouldn't you want that? And frankly, your kingdom needs it. And the world, meanwhile, will be blessed because you're engaging in that. So I guess the uh, the ultimate message is, you know, for the bottom feeders, you're supposed to have sex with your husband, except it's vertical thought sex, which means Bible in you, God in you, the confidence of glory. Colossians one twenty five through twenty seven. 